uh, Lucinda, in her introductory remarks, um, drew your attention to the little bit about the history of this house, uh, that it was once the uh, country home of the, the Guinness family. And uh, there is a presidency connection. Uh, this is our seventh presidency. Uh, our first presidency was in 1974, uh, just the year after uh, our accession. The then Foreign Minister was the late Dr Garrett Fitzgerald, and one of the tasks that uh, he had to undertake during that presidency was to convene and host uh, the informal meeting of Foreign Ministers known as the Gimnich. Uh, and he didn't feel that there was a suitable building uh, at the time which was owned by the state, and he borrowed this house for the occasion uh, from the Guinness family. It was still in private ownership uh, at that stage, and he hosted the Gimnich here uh, in this building. And all of the ministers uh, and their spouses and partners uh, stayed here uh, as his guests. And it's interesting to reflect on the fact that when that meeting was held here in 1974, uh, there were just nine ministers. Uh, we had just gone, the union, wasn't called of course the union then, but gone from six member states to nine. And as we meet here on this occasion 39 years later, uh, we are about to go from 27 uh, to 28. And I think it is worth reflecting on the huge progress uh, that has been made uh, since the first presidency event was held here in this house in 1974 uh, to uh, today. Uh, Ireland is and always has been a strong advocate of European Union enlargement and of the European future of the Western Balkans. It is a matter of particular pride that it was during the last Irish presidency in 2004 that we held the Day of Welcomes here in Dublin with the accession of 10 new member states. And during our current presidency, we want to see concrete progress in the accession process for all the candidates and prospective candidates. As such, enlargement is a priority for the Irish presidency. And while we are nearing the end of our time uh, in that presidency, there are still a number of important decisions to be considered on the enlargement dossier. While the tendency in recent years has been for the Council to consider enlargement only in the second half of the year, with a focus around the Commission's annual progress reports, the Danish presidency saw a change in that trend with decisions made on Serbia and Montenegro. The Council conclusions agreed last December allowed for the possibility of similar important decisions on the former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia, Serbia and Kosovo during Ireland's term. And of course, we are due to see the completion of Croatia's journey to EU membership with their accession on the 1st of July. Beyond the Western Balkans, we are working to reinvigorate the accession process with Turkey, and I hope to see a negotiation chapter opened before the end of our presidency. While the new government in Iceland has called for a review of the accession negotiations, I would hope that this review will highlight the benefits to both Iceland and the EU of accession. I believe that the fact that enlargement is appearing more frequently on Council agendas is evidence of the positive moves that are taking place in the region. When things are not progressing, we don't have much to talk about. Now that there is momentum, the Council has much to consider. And yet, despite this recent activity, we are possibly not as far along as we might have hoped ten years after the historic summit in Thessaloniki. I hope that you will use the occasion of this conference to reflect on why that is and how the accession process has evolved and on where we may go in the future. While we are seeing more activity on the enlargement agenda, this is not an easy time to be singing the virtues of greater expansion of the Union. Back in 2003, the economies of the EU were buoyant. The Union, then made up of 15 member states, 
was less than a year away from welcoming 10 new members. The countries of the Western Balkans were emerging from a decade of conflict. There was optimism across Europe as to our shared future and a recognition that to ensure stability, the countries in the southeast of our continent also needed to be encouraged on the path to EU membership and welcomed in when they were ready. The intervening decade has seen many changes that have had a bearing on the EU accession process for the Western Balkan countries. The EU has changed. We are grappling with deep economic challenges that have by necessity caused us to focus more on our internal workings. The door to membership is not closed, but just as the EU has changed, the process by which one becomes a member has changed in the last decade, and indeed the Western Balkans region has changed too. The five countries that signed the declaration in 2003 have now become seven, and each is at a different place on the path to EU membership. While today we are considering the progress of the region, it must be remembered that the accession process itself is based on its own merits. So each country's path will be different, influenced by its own internal dynamics and difficulties, and by the different positions from which each starts the journey to EU accession. Croatia is the obvious success story. At the time of the Thessaloniki summit, they had just applied for membership. Croatia was confirmed as a candidate country during Ireland's last EU presidency in 2004, and now we are just weeks from their acceding as a full member of the Union, and indeed uh, I'm delighted to welcome here today uh, the first Deputy Prime Minister, uh, Vesna Pusic, uh, to give her reflections on Croatia's path uh, to uh, EU membership. So in 10 years, we have managed to see one of the seven countries get to the point of accession. What of the other six? Montenegro is now in accession negotiations. At the time of the Thessaloniki summit, Montenegro was a part of Serbia and Montenegro. Having declared independence in June 2006, Montenegro signed a stabilisation and association agreement with the EU in October 2007 applied for membership in December 2008 and was granted candidate status in December 2010 and saw the launch of accession negotiations in June 2012. By EU standards, that is a blistering pace. Their chief negotiator, uh, Ambassador uh, Pejovic, will be able to tell us more of this journey. The former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia has been a candidate since 2005. It is disappointing that we have not uh, been able to open accession negotiations yet. I want to acknowledge the work of uh, Commissioner uh, Fule and the Macedonian uh, government, represented here today uh, by Foreign Minister Popovsky, on their efforts to keep up the momentum of the reform agenda through the high-level accession dialogue. It is important to continue to carry out EU reforms in line with what will be required for membership so that when the Council can agree to proceed to negotiations, the Macedonian Government can move forward at a fast pace. I certainly hope that that decision comes soon. Serbia received candidate status last year. It started later uh, on the path to EU accession with negotiations on a stabilisation and association agreement opening in October 2005. And there have been some bumps along the road. However, the strong support of recent governments for EU membership is clear. Cooperation with the International Criminal Tribunal on the former Yugoslavia was an important prerequisite. The capture and rapid transfer to the Hague Tribunal of the last indictees has allowed this issue to be closed so far as it affects Serbia's further progress on EU integration. The Council has asked that Serbia continue to work towards a visible and sustainable improvement in relations with Kosovo. And I would like to take this opportunity to again commend the political courage and consistent efforts shown by both Prime Minister Dacic and Prime Minister Thaci, and to thank High Representative Catherine Ashton for her very active engagement as a facilitator of the process. Serbia has been a candidate for just over a year. 
The Stabilisation and Association Agreement will hopefully be ratified in the coming weeks, and the Council in June will consider the possibility of agreeing a date to open accession negotiations. The remaining three countries of the region are not yet official candidates for EU membership. Albania has applied and has been given some work to do before the Council will consider candidate status. The December Council conclusions set out a perspective for Albania which took account of its EU-related achievements and showed the way towards its European future. I hope that the upcoming elections will see the Albanian people give their political leaders a mandate to further strengthen their efforts in reaching that goal. Bosnia and Herzegovina has not made the progress we would like to have seen. We were hopeful of progress following the formation of a government in December 2011 and the passing of two EU-related laws last year. We also had the launch of the high-level dialogue in June, which saw agreement on a roadmap towards accession. But since then, progress has stalled. While we will continue to encourage movement on the path to EU integration, this is ultimately a matter for the political leaders of Bosnia and Herzegovina. The EU cannot impose a solution. What we can do is to use our policies to encourage and facilitate progress, and we will continue to do that. And finally, we have Kosovo, which in 2003 was under UN administration. The fact that five EU member states do not recognise Kosovo's unilateral declaration of independence has complicated the EU's relationship with Kosovo. However, the Council has confirmed Kosovo's EU perspective and we are taking steps to support Kosovo on that path. I am hopeful that the June European Council will see a further step taken in that regard. So this is where we have come from and where we are now. What of the future? There is no denying that the new applicants for EU membership are being held to a higher account than their predecessors, not least due to the increase in the scope and depth of the acquis. The EU has not remained static, neither can the accession process. I can understand the concerns of candidates and prospective candidates that accession is a moving target, but that is the reality. The EU train will not wait at the station for aspiring passengers to catch up and board. The countries from the Western Balkans that join the Union in the future will be very different from those countries today, just as the Union they will join will be very different from that operating now. Accession is a long, slow process, but it is one that requires continual forward movement. Stalling or stopping will likely to result in regression and a possible return to the instability that we saw in the early 1990s, and that is in no one's interest. So realistically, where can we hope to be 10 years from now at the 20th anniversary of the Thessaloniki summit? I would sincerely hope to uh, see at least three more Western Balkan states, either members or on the verge of membership, though I am not prepared to be explicit as to which, of the three, uh, which, which three it might be. Whether we can manage to have all six taking their place at the Council table in 10 years' time will be dependent on the progress that they make in their individual reform processes and preparations for membership. The EU too must protect the credibility of the enlargement process and ensure that when countries do what is required of them, they are awarded accordingly. This 10-year anniversary is an appropriate juncture at which to assess the results of the Thessaloniki Agenda to 2003 to reflect on the progress made by the Western Balkan countries towards EU integration, the difficulties encountered along the way, and the outlook for completion of the project. I want to wish you well in the discussions today. I hope uh, that they will be fruitful uh, and uh, thoughtful. And uh, I now wish to give the floor uh, to uh, Commissioner Stefan Foulet uh, for his thoughts on the theme today. Stefan.